So, um, like you said, my name is Margaret. I work for Phase One and Mamiya Leaf. Uh, we're partner companies. And um, today, I'm going to talk to you about Capture One Pro, our software. And we've just introduced eight a little while back. And there's a lot of great new tools and additions to our older tools. So we're getting closer to having almost like a full uh, editing suite option with masking and uh, different local adjustments and tools you can use within local adjustments and things like that. So I want to bring it to everyone's attention so they can become familiar with how Capture One works and it can be you know, widely spread. Everybody will be able to use it as opposed to just, uh, just the professional market and just for tethered shooting and just, you know, we have a lot more to offer and we want everyone to see it because I feel we have the best image quality and processing engine, so you should get the best results from processing with our software. It's mainly a raw converter, that's what it does best. So um, I want to just show you all how it works and see how you feel about 8. Okay, so Capture One 8 now has more options in terms of what mode you can run it in. So we basically have the same download, but depending on your activation key and what mode you choose when you're prompted to when you first install the software, you can run in DB, which is Digital Back, which is a version we made that's it's a full version, but only works with digital back files, like our credos, our phase backs, all you know. We made it so that those people would have access to the software without having to purchase a key because they obviously have purchased a full system from us. So we have digital back, and then we have Pro, which we always had. We also used to have an Express version, but instead of Express this time, we have an Express for Sony and a Pro for Sony, which focuses on Sony cameras specifically, because we opened up a new option with Sony. So you can tether with their cameras, have file support for their cameras. You know, they're moving into a lot more camera development. So that's kind of where we are with eight. And then you still have the same options as you did in seven in terms of sessions or catalogs. Um, and I was talking about this a little bit in the beginning with you. It gets a little confusing, but we opened up the doors to catalogs in Capture One Seven, so people could have that same workflow that they may have had with other programs. Um, so, you know, sessions, I think sessions are great. It's what I'm used to, but I think that's like a per job kind of routine is good with a session. It builds a structure. You have a capture folder, an output folder. It's all built for you already into a session, where a catalog is basically one file, which is nice in terms of uh, archiving at the end if you want to put a bunch of images into a catalog and know what you edited and selected and everything else. It's all in one place. So for today, I'm going to probably work with a session since we're doing one job here, and it's, it's a good way to show you the structure that breaks down in the capture folder and everything else. But we've made a lot of improvements with our catalogs in 8. They're much faster, and we have better metadata entry and, and uh, archiving and things like that. Um, so it's, it's pretty nice now and if you want to take that route with the software. And then, so of course today I'm going to focus on the improved creative tools more than anything else, um, as opposed to uh, archiving or certain workflow things. But we're going to focus on the creative tools, because they're the most fun and the most, um, I think, beneficial to your images. And then, OK, so some of the other advancements range from our, we're known for having excellent tethered software. Um, it's very easy to tether. It's very stable. Uh, we also have Live View option and shooting from Live View now, as opposed to having to leave Live View and then shoot. Um, so these things have all been improved um, along with creating session and catalog templates. So for instance, uh, instead of just being able to save a workspace, it's fully customizable. You can create a template of uh, what you want your next capture to be named, where you want it to be stored, all this information, so that when you go to create a new session, you select that template, you don't have to think about it again. You just have your workspace, your template, everything designed the way you like where you want every tool, how many tools you want out, that sort of thing. So it became even better in 8. And then we have a new and updated processing engine for faster tethering, processing, loading your thumbnails. Um, so you have a, you know, a full preview. 
and then importing as well as a smoother transition uh, with our tool sliders and when while you're browsing as well. So you're not experiencing a lot of glitching or you know, speed issues. So the creative tools. Uh, we added to our Clarity tool, we added a natural option. Uh, what's great about our Clarity tool is it's, we deal with micro contrast, so we're dealing with it on per pixel level. So it makes a nice uh, contrast per pixel without looking over sharpened or you know, creating too much noise. Um, and natural is really great because we're not overdoing any tones, there's not extra saturation. It's a really nice feature. So I'm going to show you all the different options with Clarity. And then our black and white conversions improved. So you can go per color channel and actually change the entire look and feel of an image when you create a black and white, uh, when you convert to black and white. And you'll see that. You can almost invert the entire photo and it just looks very nice, very artistic if you want to go that angle. And then we have a new film grain tool which is one of my favorite, because you're brought back to like actual days of film grain, high, high ISO film, things like that, and the look and feel of that, and it's nice. It's a nice creativity option. And then our local adjustment additions. So now within your local adjustment, if you make a mask, you can selectively change the white balance of the mask and the high dynamic range, which wasn't an option earlier. Um, in seven, we didn't have those two options to selectively work with HDR only part of the photo. And then obviously our HDR tool has been improved as well. And then we included repair layers for healing and cloning to make it very simple. You'll have an adjustment option, heal or clone, and then your brush will follow through with that. So it's pretty direct on how you're gonna use it. And that's great because we didn't have a heal and clone, we only had a spot tool earlier, so this is a nice new like full editing option. So okay, let's see if we can get started here. Okay. Let's start at the top. So I want to start with the clarity. And if you look at this photo, it's actually a little bit soft. Where it's in focus is very minimal at best. So in this case, clarity is going to kind of help sharpen this a little bit without making it look over sharpened or like we're trying to correct a, you know, totally out of focus picture. So I'm going to just select here. I'm just going to do five because we have five, well, we have four clarity options. And I'm just going to leave the first image on the left as the untouched, unedited file. So let me just scroll in. Kind of get a feel. Zoom in a little bit. And now on the left-hand side over here, if you look where my cursor is, you're going to see all the tool options. So there's the capture tool, the library tool. Right now I'm in the library tool and you'll see that I'm in a session. I have my capture folder with all my images and I also have my selects folder should I choose to move a select item. Uh, my output if I process to a TIFF, JPEG, DNG, whatever you want, whatever your choice is, JPEG, and then the trash folder if I decide to delete something. So we're going to actually go to this is the camera tool, which we're not going to work in today. This is for tethering mostly. And this is your exposure tool. So clarity is located under the exposure tool by default. So right now, the first option they give you is natural. So I'm going to apply it just to this image here. And I'm going to go pretty drastic, just so everybody can see. You can see compared to the other one, so we have a bit more sharpening, but even at 100, it's not crazy, but at least we have a little bit of pop in the eyes now, a little sharper eye um, you know, contrast. If we go to the next option, which is punch, 
we increase our clarity, you're going to see a lot heavier saturation and obviously big difference in the highlights. Then neutral, which still at this high of a, you know, for the sake of presentation, it's still a bit, you don't have extra saturation in the colors, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit tough compared to the natural. And then the last one being classic, which I guess is what we would find in most clarity tools, is I guess a little bit over, I would say a little bit over sharpened, whereas our natural one I think looks pretty soft, even, but still gives you the contrast you want on a very small level without making your image look uh, over sharpened. So if we Nope. No, this one's at, set at zero. Oh, yes. Sorry. So you can see up close, it's a little bit sharper here. But still her skin tone looks a little more natural than these other ones where she looks a little blown out. Obviously, we wouldn't, probably wouldn't want to go that far because you're creating kind of a halo effect. But just for the sake of presentation, you can see that things even out while giving you contrast. So it's nice to have the natural option in there just to mix it up a little bit so you're not dealing with oversaturation, over sharpening, uh, things like that. Okay. This next image, this I, I like a lot because we're dealing with black and white conversion and you can do so much with the color channels after you enable your black and white conversion. So I'm gonna go to the color tab and you'll see my black and white option is selected. I'm going to just enable black and white. So it just went from, you know, converted from color to black and white. I'll just leave the color one up there as well. And we're just going to move these channels and you're going to see in the parachute that you can make this parachute almost look white or nearly black, change the shadows, change the entire dynamic of the, the photograph, which is quite nice. So let's say you want to just give a standard look right here. I can change this white to almost gray. You can do a lot. You can almost invert the photograph just by moving these color sliders. So that's a nice feature. You're able to work in black and white and really selectively choose tones based on the color channel that was there previously, which is quite nice. And if you zoom in, you don't see any weird noise or gradation or anything going on just because you're moving color sliders when the photograph is black and white. So it's one of my favorite options because you can do totally different look per image. So let's say we take this one, enable black and white, Move our sliders a bit. Has an entirely different feel. And again, even in the shadows, you still have some detail. So that's a great, I love that tool. It's been played with a lot and made to be pretty perfect now. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is using not just the black and white option to let's say create a more interesting photograph, because this is quite standard. Maybe we want to make it look a little artsier, make it look more time oriented, you know, give it an old fashioned look. So let's say we change it to black and white. Again, you can play with these sliders so much, it could bring up the highlights so much, make it look like it's sun is shining on it. Bring in our sky, more dramatic sky, things like that. You look comparatively to the first one. And I'm just going to try some film grain to see if I can make this look like an older black and white photograph and give this kind of some life because it's pretty standard photo. So we can go to our details option here, this little magnifying glass. 
If I zoom in, and you'll see in this same box, you'll see the navigator where it shows where I zoomed in, but also focus, sharpening, noise reduction, moray, depending on what you need to do. These are all options under the detail tool. And then our addition of film grain. So if I leave it on fine, it doesn't even give me a chance. Uh, you can change the size of the grain. Uh, in fine, it won't let you do it because it wants you to just work solely in fine. But if you go all the way up, you see we added some grain to this. Just very fine grain. It's kind of nice, kind of gives it a little something in addition to the black and white. If we go choose another image, go back and just make this black and white. Just give it the same similar look. Okay, let's try a different type of grain so you can see the drastic differences. In our details tool again, go to harsh grain. You can see already, if you choose to make it more noticeable, the grain, you have that option. I'm just putting the slider all the way up so you can see the difference more clearly. But you can also change the size and you can see it becomes more obvious with the bigger grain than the smaller grain. So it's entirely up to you how you, what direction you want to go. This is kind of looking more like a, I don't know, like a charcoal or something as compared to this and where we originally started. We have multiple options. We can start applying black and white, film grain, everything else that we kind of miss, I think, in a digital world now. So it's nice to have that and not feel like your image quality is noisy or looks over, I don't know, digitized, I guess, or over-edited. Yeah. OK. So now we're going to get at this part I'm pretty excited about, because previously, as a photographer, and I've worked in all different fields, commercial, wedding, um, you know, pretty much any kind of event, anything, you name it, I've been there. Tech field, whatever, just all over the place. So this is something that's always come up. Trying to color balance with either gels or in-camera, white balance, things like that, when you have two different, clearly two different um, color balances going on. You have your daylight out here and this tungsten inside is a real difficult task. When you have, and this also, these are fluorescents also. They're not just tungsten. they are some other mix. So they look kind of odd in general. You have many different colors going on, a lot. It's just very difficult to work with. So now you can pretty much change the white balance, not just as you normally would, let's say in the color tool. I'm going to just give you an option here. White balance over here. I'm just going to use my color picker. So you see I kind of neutralize, you know, neutralize the photo. But I still have this really, now outside is just totally blue. And this, you know, it doesn't look particularly good. If I go off this, I'm getting like a green cast. So you do the best you can, and you try to work it out. And maybe you use color editor. Maybe you use desaturation on the blues. Maybe you try a bunch of things. It's a huge pain. So now we have an option in our, this is our local adjustment tool. It looks like a little paintbrush. If you zoom in, you can see it up here, local adjustments. Right now, this is considered the background layer because we haven't touched anything. We haven't added a mask or any other kind of layer. And you'll see down below, Options to change exposure and clarity, sharpening, moire, color editor, noise reduction, purple fringing, white balance, and HDR. Everything with this little paintbrush, this is built into the software. But let's say you change your workspace and you don't remember. You'll have the option to add this back into your local adjustments tools if you something gets deleted or moved or whatever the case may be. And it has this local adjustment paintbrush to let you know that it's capable of working on a local adjustment layer. So this is uh, the best part about the white balance. Now, finally having white balance in there as an option, which has been a request for a long time. So we're pretty happy we made it come into eight now. 
So what I'm going to do is just draw a basic mask. I'm going to make a new layer. I'll call it uh, Window. And you'll see right here, it says the word Adjustment next to Window, as opposed to either Clone or Heal. So this is just a standard Adjustment layer. You can zoom in, you can see it a little better. It's written right next to that, over the background layer. And then I'm just going to take the paintbrush right here, and I'm going to just draw. You can erase with the brush if you have to. If you have to go back and fix a mask, you can erase. You could provide a gradient mask, let's say, on a sky if you want to clean up the sky. Um, and I always do only display mask when drawing. Um, I prefer it because then when I go to make the local adjustment, I don't have the mask still showing up on the layer to the point where I can't see it. So always display, I never put on. Never display is, I don't really, to be quite honest, I'm not sure why you wouldn't want to see where you were drawing, but um, then there's only display. <laughs> only display. So I leave that on. And then over here, these little arrows are what let you adjust size, hardness, opacity. And if you're using, let's say, a tablet, uh, you have the pen pressure option. So it, it's sensitive to drawing you know, freehand. And an auto, we do have auto mask. In this case, I'm not going to use auto mask. Um, I'm going to selectively choose it. But auto mask is pretty good at deciding where your edges are and how you're making a mask to help you if you're having issues drawing it. It's, it's a pretty good feature to have there. Um, so I'm not going to use that today. But you'll see as you go up, the brush size changes. And as you're looking at that, there's an inner circle, if you notice. That's the radius of the sharpest point of the mask. The outer circle reflects where the feathering is going to end. So you get an idea, a little more idea of what's going on with it. Bring my, I'm going to just kind of leave it towards the middle, just for this. And then you can see more is, you know, in the center than it is the outside of it. I know this is not the best mask in the world, but just so you can see. You can obviously do this with a more refined tablet. OK, so I'm just going to leave it kind of basic. Now the mask disappears. So now when I go to the white balance tool over here, I'm not even going to select, because we already kind of selected the overall balance. I'm actually going to look at the Kelvin temperature. So you can see more drastically that it's going very yellow or very blue. So we made it warmer, which is a little too much. It's a little green now. You can actually bring in a little more magenta in there on the tint. And that looks far better now. Looks more color balanced. We have some daylight have a more uh, even inside light, what we would normally see. Compare that to the original. You can see there's some drastic, much easier way of color balance, white balancing, than playing with too many gels, playing with too much lighting. If you need to go in and do an architectural shoot and you can't have lights and everything all over the place and you can't take that much time, at least you know this is an option. You get your best white balance and then work from there locally without having to go into any other external program. You're working right off a RAW file. Um, this is an older RAW file. We used to have an extension TIF for our P-series backs as an option, but it's not actually a TIFF. It's a RAW file. But you work right off the RAW file without even touching the RAW file. These are all just settings applied. And as soon as you process, it creates a file with your settings. So you're never harming your image, never changing anything permanently. It's all being stored separately within the session structure. So that's what's really nice. You can kind of get this done pretty much on set if you had to. Let's say you're shooting tethered. Now you can do this right in front of an art director, and they know what, what, you know, what the outcome is, or a magazine, or whoever's with you. So I like that one the, almost the best. So the next part, I'm going to work with our new healing options. And when you create a new layer, you can do new heal layer. It's the best way to work with this. And let's say I want to remove, I, I think maybe the best thing to remove is you know, some of the tourists here in the background. It's not bad, but I don't really want them there. They are kind of look like weird dots there, and I'm going to take them out. 
So now you can do this like just pre-processing, which is nice because you don't have to mess with any of the quality or create all these extra layers that you have to worry about how much they're degrading the image and so forth. So I'll do this, I'll call this people, this layer. I'm just going to zoom in. See these people over here. And again, we have to select our brush, same deal. Right, local adjustments. Select our size, which by the way, you can also control click or right click and change the brush size right here. I mean, just to make this kind of easier, I'm just going to kind of bring up the, the hardness a little. And the way it works with Capture One is you start drawing your mask. Capture One then decides a point to choose that you want to use to pull from to heal to kind of mesh over these people and make it blend with the surrounding area, but you're free to change it after they choose it. So, say I draw this. It chose the sky for some very odd reason. But <laughs> if I move this, I get to kind of choose this selection point myself, and it's going to move it over and cover those, that person up. Eventually, that then goes away. This automatically goes away. It's just until I scroll back over, if you notice. And really, it's kind of like they were never there. I mean, I'm at 100%. Obviously, you know, they're a little out of focus, too, so it's kind of helping me in this situation. But just so you can see, they're pretty much out of there with really no crazy amount of time or effort. So if you go into this again, you can start actually adding mass to the same heel layer. Does a similar option. I can change it up a little bit. You see my mass changing its kind of outcome. And it'll, it'll be very obvious. It'll move. I mean, it's hard to kind of see, I think, here. But do you see those two, those little masked areas kind of moving? And they look very obvious. And then they blend pretty well after you let go of the mouse. So that's kind of nice to have in there. You can do that on all these people. Nope. To kind of redo that guy, but. So same idea, pretty easy. You might have to go back in a little bit, but for the sake of presentation, you can see how quickly four little areas were removed. It's not like the spot tool where you have only a tiny little area and it just kind of covers it and guesses. We have an option now to really work with heal and clone and all the things you kind of become familiar with as you edit in photography. So compared to this, it's kind of nice. Now I don't have these little dots in the background of people there. And then we'll move on to the clone tool. So you can see both options for layers. And I have this kind of wire here. Now, a lot of people would say, OK, I can crop this out. I can kind of paint over it a little bit. I can do whatever, but I don't want to lose these little areas, these little peaks of the mountain, or anything like that. In addition, I also have this very dark area in front, which the HDR tool would generally help. I can bring up the shadows without affecting anything else, and hopefully it'll, it'll work out. But in this case, I chose this image because using the HDR tool over this entire image creates problems in the highlights and other areas as you go. You can't get as much shadow detail as you'd like. So we're going to do a selection to uh, selectively choose out areas for HDR and also clone at the same time, because you're probably going to have to do more than one on you know, most images. So we want to see kind of how it builds. So here in the Adjustments tab, where the HDR tool is, 
the exposure tab, you can bring up the shadows. But it's kind of, I still have problems down in the lower left hand corner. I have brought up a lot of this. Maybe it's okay, maybe it's not. I'm at 100% right now and I'm kind of not happy with that situation. So I'm gonna just do it a little bit, do what I like. I don't need the highlight slider because we're not really, there's nothing here I need to bring back in terms of highlights. So I'm gonna leave that for now. And I'm gonna go to my local adjustments and take care of this, this wire in the meantime. So in this case, the clone is a good idea. And I know we all kind of choose back and forth. Are we gonna use a healing option? Are we gonna use a cloning option? What works? Everybody has different ways of feathering and, and so forth. So you get both options here. But this is good for clone because you just have kind of a blue even spot here. You can just clone very easily. So we'll just write wire. And again, we have to do our mask. This is a very rough mask, and it's kind of impressive that it can handle such poor drawing skills. Well, that was not a good option, but let's just see here. I'm just going to choose a better selection point. Okay. And you already kind of have most of the wire gone. In this case, for whatever reason, it wouldn't, I, I don't think my mask was completed correctly. So I'm going to do another clone layer just to make it easy. Bring down this brush size a little, control click. Mask. Keeps pulling from kind of a much brighter area. Just, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I don't know why. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Finally. And then you've kind of cloned out without having to heal and worry about other areas coming in or blending in where you don't need them to. Like clouds, for instance, you're gonna to wanna to heal so that you can kind of pull in other forms of clouds, things like that. So you have your clone and healing option, which is really nice, but I still have this problem in the front with this shadow area. I'm not too happy about that. So I'm gonna make another just regular adjustment layer. We'll call it uh, you know, front, because we know it's in the front. I'm going to go down to the HDR slider over here. Just take a look. We have it now selectively as local adjustment. You still need to draw a mask. I know it's kind of a very poor mask, but just to see. Now it disappears, so when I go to this slider down here on the left-hand side and open up my shadows, you'll see I'll get a little more depth in here as compared to before. Is that more obvious now, what it's doing? So I get even more depth than I originally got with the other slider. And I can kind of just selectively choose without affecting any other part, even if I don't want to touch this, if these shadows are open enough. So it's kind of a nice feature now, rather than having to do it on the entire shadow area or highlight area. So then I took an image here. This was from a wedding. Actually, we'll use this, because this is even in worse shape. And I'm just going to do a couple of things to just kind of make this, you know, a better photograph. It's way too tilted, a bunch of things are going on here. And I'm gonna try to straighten it or rotate it, which is kind of a nice option. Kind of like a crop tool, but you're rotating right, right on screen without having to worry about where the crop is gonna fit or not fit. So you lose some image, but let's say I have to correct this at this point. hit that to just get that off that screen. And I go into my exposure just like you would in anything else. 
And I still have my clouds are still pretty out. I go to the highlight slider, but it's kind of bringing them down. They're kind of getting a little dull. I'm not really OK with that. So I'm going to go and just make a simple local adjustment for an HDR layer. Just very quickly. And now I can really bring these highlights in without affecting the rest of the photograph. You can even go back to just the overall exposure and even open it up a little bit if you want. Add some saturation, maybe even only in the sky. So if you go back to your original adjustment layer, you can also change just the saturation of the sky. Obviously, this is a little oversaturated, but just so you can see, you can just change the blue in the sky alone. Take it away, put it in, however you want to do that selectively. Those are probably the primary creative tools um, I would say are the most beneficial right now to move forward without having to go into another program. You can really spot things out, edit things out, and so forth. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.